50 minutes or one hour. Okay, I'm sorry about this. From, from Dr. Radhar uh, in the talk, which will be only spectroscopy, but my, my first picture is that of an accelerator and don't be surprised with which one. Anyway, let's go ahead. I'll give a short introduction, then I'll talk about electron spectroscopy for the study of electronic structure of solids in, in general. Then we'll talk some aspects of the low TC and high TC superconductors, and I'll just mention briefly in one or two slides about future work. Okay, so superconductors are of course special because they have no resistance. They can conduct electricity without power losses. Now, one of the biggest applications of, of uh, superconductors is uh, the requirement of large volume, stable and high intensity magnetic fields for magnetic resonance imaging. So this is where they are really used. Uh, I mean, there's no, no alternative but to use uh, superconductors. And all these applications use low temperature superconductors. It's a very big uh, business dominated by a few companies like uh, Oxford, and, and C Oxford Instruments and Siemens. And they all use, most of them use ni niobium titanium superconductors, which is a TC of 10 Kelvin. Um, the high temperature superconductors don't match uh, for cost effective uh, reasons. Although uh, niobium titanium use means you have to use liquid helium for, for cooling below the, the transition temperature DC and liquid helium is really expensive today. It costs more than $20 a, a, a liter and hence uh, it's really expensive, but still it's preferred to, it's still cheaper than using high, high TC superconductors. Okay, so this is the, the picture that makes me laugh a little because I'm showing the part, the, the other main applications or use of high field magnets are particle accelerators. And the biggest one is of course the Large Hadron Collider, which is a 27 kilometer circumference and uh, uses uh, tons of magnets to, to actually work. I mean, it, it, when they were constructing this, I, I read on, on Wikipedia that they had to use something like 30% of the total uh, production of uh, niobium titanium magnets in the whole world for five years continuously. So it's, it's okay. So shall we start again? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'll talk about the electronic structure of low TC and high TC superconductors. Okay, how, next slide. I have to just tell you or? or... Yeah, you can say just next. Right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll give, give a brief introduction and, and then talk about some electron spectroscopy in general for electronic structure of solids. Then I'll talk about uh, some, some low TC and high TC superconductors and, and tell you what could be interesting measurements later in the future. Okay, next. So superconductors are special, of course, because they have no resistance. They conduct electricity without power loss. The biggest application is, is the large volume, stable, high intensity magnetic fields for magnetic resonance imaging, the CT scans in hospitals, and, and uh, it's a very big business. Um, the magnets normally used are very low superconductors, which is normally niobium titanium and high temperature superconductors, although become superconducting with liquid nitrogen, they are still too expensive to make. And so people still use, I mean, all companies still use uh, 
uh, niobium titanium low tc superconductors okay next go to the next slide please there are many other applications which are mainly high field scientific magnets and uh, uh, these are normally the main ones are used in particle accelerators for example the large hadron collider which is a huge particle accelerator the biggest in the world is is 27 kilometers long uh, circumference which means uh, we are actually accelerating particles at the speed of light over 27 kilometers and uh, with enormous uh, uh, applied voltages 3.5 terawatts or uh, it was the the first number which is now 6.5 terawatts but it 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 does give the relevant <laughs> Uh, uh, information that people are are seeking mainly things like uh, higgs bosons and and hadrons can be measured with this but okay far beyond my understanding so okay can we go to the next slide An another another uh, application is is um, uh, okay this is this is the structure of of the large hadron collider which is 3 kilometers long okay this slide now uh, the another application is in plasma fusion reactors <clears throat> which is trying to make a, a plasma of 500 megawatts for designed for for working with 20 minutes with an input of 50 megawatts so one is talking of a tenfold gain of plasma heating power and this is a a major experiment this also again uses huge amount of of uh, it has 500 tons of niobium titanium superconductors but i'm telling these numbers only to say that it's very interesting that <clears throat> the condensed matter properties of the superconductivity is used in totally <laughs> the major users are are the, the other physics plasma physics as well as the 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 particle physics work okay and we are talking about samples like a few millimeters or or a few grams to be measured in in a, in a in in accelerators used for synchrotron radiation and this is a picture of of the place i work we have two synchrotrons here there's one small one on the left uh, top corner which is which is um, uh, the taiwan light source which is about 25 years old and uh, four and a half years back we started the bigger one which is called the taiwan photon source now the the requirement is what we what we are looking for in these uh, synchrotrons are tunable x-ray beams with high photon flux we we also need polarization dependent uh, beams and uh, the the other important requirement is we need to focus them to a few micron size so that we can do experiments on solids with the uh, spatial resolution of a few microns when required okay next so so i'll i'll tell you how we use synchrotron and related uh, sources which are lasers uh, lab las lasers as well as things on on free uh, free electron sources which is on an accelerator okay and how we study electronic structure of solids okay next slide please so i i'm going to talk this uh, a real basic thing for for master course what i remember as a student as a master course what were questions to me okay so what is a solid and uh, it's an ordered or disordered collection of atoms and we are looking for its properties what are their properties electrical magnetic thermal optical etc and important uh, materials are metals and insulators things like uh, copper and diamond as the best examples and then we have semiconductors in between which are uh, i mean we can't live without semiconductors now every one of us uses them on a daily basis and then there are other things like superconducting magnets and 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 uh, glass and the the interest being of course to see what are their properties okay next slide please we we try to study the relation between the crystal structure the properties 
with the electrical magnetic properties and we need to know valency and the electronic uh, energy levels which is the electronic structure of material okay examples of course of good metals are copper wire and gold uh, is used in many important issues and then we have uh, you know technology like we have superconducting magnets which are used for 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 maglev trains and now the present record is 602 kilometers per hour so we need to make good magnets okay and uh, then then one can um, to get those good magnets you need good superconductors so so one is definitely uh, linked to the other and then of course there are insulators and uh, carbon carbon is uh, is <laughs> as black as it is beautiful as, as diamond okay <laughs> and um, silica which is the source of silicon <clears throat> so what we really need to know is what are the electronic properties and electronic energies of uh, the energies of electrons in these materials, how they are different and how they can be tuned. To, to know what their structure is, we need to do electron spectroscopy. And the most common form is photoemission spectroscopy. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. I, I of course, uh, we, we need to study is um, semiconductors and these also can be measured with with uh, photo emission spectroscopy to know what are their energy levels next slide please i mean one can have all types of uh, leds and one can have uh, white leds which are important now so i'll say some of okay next slide please i'm saying this all because i think it's important to know the link between colors and and energy okay um this becomes important in, in electron spectroscopy, especially if you're doing high resolution spectroscopy. And uh, we know that uh, uh, red light is something like uh, 700 nanometers and it's about 1.8 1 1 electron volts. Violet is uh, 400 nanometers and it's about 3.1 electron volts. Another, okay, next slide, please. Another important thing we need to always remember is one electron volt is 11,600 Kelvin roughly. One milli electron volt is 11 Kelvin and 300 Kelvin room temperature is 25 millivolts. Uh, 25 millivolts, sorry, I've made a typing mistake. That's it's 25 millivolts. And since we are doing electrons, we, we need to, to remember the Fermi Dirac function. And as a function of temperature, the Fermi Dirac function has changes as shown in this, this graph. For example, red curve is at 150 Kelvin. The, the X scale is milli electron volts. Okay. Uh, sorry, this is this is yeah, milli, milli electron volts. Okay. And 300 K is the blue curve, and 600 K is the black curve. Okay, this is this is electron volt scale. Okay. Okay, next, next slide, please. I, I'm just telling brief topics of interest, which one will read in textbooks, which becomes a, a, a necessary input at some level to, to learn about solids, okay? Free electron metals, which is modeled as a Fermi gas, band semiconductors, correlated metals, and Fermi liquid. These are metals which cannot be explained by free electron model. And since they are metals, they can't be explained by, by, as, as a semiconductor. And then one can have even more complex uh, insulators, which are correlated insulators, where the insulating property comes due to Coulomb energy correlations. Now, all these things invariably are important to study because they tell us about metal, when, when a material can be a metal, when it can be an insulator. And there are materials which show mixed valency, which means in one single material, you will have two types of valency for the same element, okay? And of course, one, one has um, superconductivity as, as an important property, as I mentioned. Recently, there are many materials which are called topological materials, which become very important to study surfaces. And these have a potential uh, to, to do things like uh, quantum computers on uh, computing uh, uh, processes okay but of course not yet not yet really realized 
And then there are things like charge density wave transitions, which one can study in, in materials. And uh, these more or less constitute a large number of um, um, important research in, in uh, electronic structure of solids today. Okay, next slide, please. Now I'll briefly tell you about the experimental techniques that we use uh, to study electronic structure. One can use uh, uh, photo emission spectroscopy. And when I say electronic structure, we, we need to distinguish between occupied and unoccupied electronic states. And the occupied part is of course, we can do as core levels and valence band. And the unoccupied states are the conduction band states in the normal definition. And how we can use photo emission spectroscopy to study, um, we can only do that to study the occupied core levels and valence band. The conduction band states we need to study using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And um, the other techniques which are related, resonant photo emission, angle result photo emission, and X-ray emission spectroscopy are still occupied spectroscopies, but with, with additional features. Uh, important issue is try to relate the techniques with things in, in a textbook, okay? So to start with the simple photoelectric effect, which is uh, the Einstein's equation for which he got the Nobel prize, the photon energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the binding energy and a work function phi. So if we know, if we, if we have a, a photon source and we have a, a, a way of measuring electrons, which are by the photoelectric effect, which are emitted from a solid, then we can back calculate the binding energy. We of course need to know the work function of, of the spectrometer when we do the photo emission experiment. The, the experimental variables are, we can tune or change the mean free path by changing the incident photon energy. We can change the temperature of the sample. We can use the polarization of the incident photons and we can do time result spectroscopy. Um, these are techniques which are, the, the time resolution spectroscopy has really increased in the last few years. The other three has been the, the, so to say, basic photo emission spectroscopy for a long time, more than about 60 years now. More recently, we, people have started using photon sources, which are low energy lasers, or even what are called high harmonic generation lasers, which are, can be from ultraviolet to soft X-rays. Now, all these things can be lab sources including things like soft X-ray, magnesium K-alpha and aluminum K-alpha. Now, why is synchrotron important? Synchrotron is important because you not only get energies of different photons, but you can actually tune them while you do the experiment, which is not possible in the other lasers or, 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 or laboratory sources. And this tunability is, is, a, is a big help the other reason that one uses synchrotron is the intensity of synchrotron photon sources is at a minimum about 1000 times more than any of these other sources. So in, in some sense, if <laughs> as a PhD student, if I had to do electron spectroscopy in a laboratory, what I'll need to do in, in uh, 1000 days, I can do it in one day at a synchrotron, okay? <laughs> That's just putting it mildly. Okay, so the schematics for the experimental techniques are the next. So, okay, I need to show that when you shine a photon source on the leftmost side is, is what is shown as UPS or ultraviolet photo emission, which means the photon incident photon is an ultraviolet photon. You remove an electron using the, 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 the photoelectric effect and measure the kinetic energy of the electrons. Then you can calculate back what is the binding energy of the electrons. If the photon source was a X-ray, then it's the, the middle uh, uh, panel, which shows that you have, you can even excite core levels and, and measure core level photo emission. You can also measure uh, valence band with X-rays. And then you need to worry about what are the photoionization cross-section changes when you go from UPS to XPS. And in the last column, there is X-ray absorption to study unoccupied states, which I won't get into today. Okay, okay. next slide, please. Um, a more handwritten 
picture is you shine a photon source, remove an electron from a valence band or remove an electron from a conduction band. Again, just to overview once more, you can use photon energies varying from very low 6 eV to 100 eV for ultraviolet spectroscopy, soft X-rays from 100 to 2 keV, 100 eV to 2 keV, or you can use hard X-rays 6 to 10 keV. Okay, next slide, please. Now, what are the applications of photoemission spectroscopy? You can, of course, identify elements. You can quantify the amount of each element in a sample. You can identify valency of the elements, distinguish between metals and insulators, characterize mixed valency if some material is mixed valent, and you can measure superconducting properties, the gap and the symmetry of the gap, which I'll, I'll talk about more. I won't get into the last topic, which is to identify correlated metals and correlated insulators. I'll just briefly show some results. Okay, next slide, please. So please remember the periodic table is a, is a very important part of uh, photoemission spectroscopy and it, it, it really helps to, to know. Uh, I, I keep a periodic uh, table chart on my table all the time and I'm, I'm referring to you on a daily basis, okay? And one can then distinguish between what are the elements as you measure in a spectroscopy. Okay, next slide, please. Now I'm going to tell you <laughs> a, a very strange way about what is spectroscopy. I, I think of it as a, as a measurement of a quantity in which how many times you can change one state to another state by doing some process. Now, let me clarify what I'm, what I mean by this. So any experiment actually is, is doing some, something to a, 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 an object, which could be a, a sample you applied a voltage or a sample on which you shine a photon source. And you're changing something by doing that and then measuring the change. So this is changing one state to another state by doing some process, okay? Now this is, is given by Fermi's golden rule. This is, this is the, the way what it, one writes, what is a, a spectroscopy measurement where the leftmost gamma is, is the, the transition probability of measuring something which goes from state I to state F. And it's written as, as this bracket where I is the initial state, H prime is what is causing this change and F is the final state. And then you have a, a, a multiplication of, of the density of states. Now this same sentence in a, in a strongly physics or a quantum mechanical way goes to the next slide, please. What I said before is actually more strongly written, said as in quantum physics, any measured quantity is given by the transition probability per unit time from one energy eigenstate of a quantum system into another energy eigenstate due to a perturbation, okay? So the perturbation is the Hamiltonian. What you're perturbing with, you're using a photon or you're applying a voltage to measure resistivity or, or you could be doing a, a magnetic measurement. And what is the probability that you can change a state from I to F? and measure that and find out what is the, the, the parameters of the experiment, the, the electron energy levels in a photoemission spectroscopy or uh, the current in a, in a resistivity measurement or any other uh, physical parameter, okay? Okay, next slide, please. So the, the most important thing that we need to know is what is called the matrix element, which couples the initial state to the final state the, 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 the square of, of the matrix element determines the, the measurement intensity that you get times the density of states, okay? Okay, next slide. So in, in the photoemission experiment, one really has a, a lot of uh, uh, equipment which is necessary, starting with a ultra high vacuum pump and a, a, a system which you can go down to something like 10 is to minus 10 tor at least, because the, the experiment is a very surface sensitive uh, measurement. You are probing typically 10 to 100 angstroms of the surface. So your surface needs to be uh, very clean 
and you cannot have gas uh, uh, around it through which the electrons will travel because the electrons will have to travel from the sample to this hemisphere, which is the analyzer, which is typically a, a meter or so from the sample. And uh, if, if the vacuum is, is not uh, 10 to minus 10, then you lose uh, information by collisions because the inelastic mean free path is, is very small, okay? So you need ultra high vacuum and you can do experiments. This one is for example, with 6.5 kilo electron volts and typical photon fluxes are 10 raised to 11 per photons per second in a, in a spot, which is like 40 by 40 micrometers, okay? So this is, uh, this is enormous intensity. And one uses an energy analyzer, which is uh, a commercial one normally to, to measure the electron energies. Okay, next slide, please. So I'll, I'll rush through this. Um, a typical experiment means you insert the sample, prepare the surface, choose the photon energy and calibrate the energy scale to determine energy resolution, okay? How does one do that? Next slide, please. You can measure, for example, a, a reference sample, which is normally gold. And then depending on the binding energy or, or the kinetic energy that you measure, and estimate the binding energy and calibrate your energy scale with that, okay? A, a more rigorous test is the next slide, please. Is measuring the valence band and the valence band uh, is measured that of gold, which is a, a, a good reference sample, has a, a, a finite energy step near the, the right end of the, of the X scale, which, is the Fermi step. This is an indication of a metal and the metal has an energy for any, any sample uh, connected to the spectrometer, which is electrically con connected, the Fermi level of the sample and the Fermi level of the spectrometer line up uh, and, and then you can calibrate your energy scale. So that makes it, you, you need to know this position accurately in terms of energy that you use with a particular photon energy and, and then calibrate your energy scale. Now to calibrate, can you go to the next slide, please? You measure this with high resolution. Okay, before, before I continue, I should, I should say one important thing about what is called Koopman's theorem. In this whole experiment, we have assumed that the ionization energy of the material of the electron that is measured is equal to the negative of the orbital energy of the highest occupied molecular orbital. Now this Koopman's theorem is saying that after you have shined a photon source, which could be a few hundred electron volts, the assumption is that the energy levels are the same before and after the experiment. So the, ex the photon itself is not changing the energy of the electrons that it had before it was excited, okay? It's called the frozen orbital approximation. And this gives uh, consistency with experiment. And so it is a valid thing. Uh, 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 next slide, please. One small thing about Koopman I always like to talk about is, is the following. Uh, he, he got the Nobel Prize in, in 75, but it was not for physics or chemistry, it was for economics. Next slide, please. <laughs> uh, he, was, he was actually awarded the theory for what is called optimal use of resources and I, I like to say this because this is really important. This is like trying to find out what are the interactions between the inputs and outputs of production in society and their relationship to economic efficiency and prices. I'm showing this because uh, it's, it's possible for physicists to do all kinds of things, okay? So this is just for the students. Okay, next slide, please. Coming back to the photo emission experiment, if you measured a, a Fermi step, a Fermi energy, which is the, the experimental part as the symbols and the, the red line is a, is a fit to the experiment to determine what is the energy position, which is the midpoint of the edge and how broad is this edge. This breadth determines the resolution of the spectrometer, which is estimated here to be 190 milli electron volts. Okay, next slide, please. And I show you how to do this. 
So what one does is you have a density of stage, which is constant for gold near the Fermi level, which is this orange line. And then you have to, to multiply that by a Fermi Dirac function, which is this green line, okay? Now the Fermi Dirac function depends on temperature. So for example, if it was the experiment was at 10K, I would use the green line. If the experiment was at 32K, I have to use the red line. And after you, you multiply the density of states by the Fermi Dirac function, you, you have to convolute it with a Gaussian function. After you convolute it, you have to match it to the experimental data, which is the blue dots. Now, the, the width, the Gaussian required, the Gaussian function width required to match experiment with the, with the calculated um, Fermi Dirac function convoluted with the Gaussian gives you the energy position of the midpoint, which make you make it the zero. That becomes the zero of the binding energy scale for spectroscopy. Okay. Okay. This is important because we'll see later how accurately you need to do this. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of how one can use uh, silicon, uh, how one can use photoemission to measure silicon, a semiconductor. And you can make out, from de depending on the binding energy, you can distinguish between elemental uh, uh, silicon as well as oxides, which will have higher binding energies, which are the arrows on, on the left side. And in, in principle, actually, on, on the right side figure, you have bulk silicon. And, and then you can actually trace back that silicon 1 plus, silicon 2 plus, silicon 3 plus, and silicon 4 plus, which is SiO2, are or have distinct energies and you can calibrate uh, or, or you know you have tables with these numbers now and you can then check what is the the measurement that you do for your sample what is the valency of, of the sample that you're measuring okay next slide another example I'll, I'll briefly say about with photo emission is metal insulated transitions now this is vanadium dioxide vo2 this has got cut here but but uh, uh, it has a temperature dependent metal to insulate a transition. It's the metal at high temperature. If you make bulk sample, the transition temperature is about 300 Kelvin. If you make thin films, the transition temperature is about 370 or so for, for this sample, okay? Now, if you take the bulk sample and, and measure above room temperature, and, uh, and which is 300 K, because it's in the metallic phase and, and below say something like 250 or 200 K your insulator, what kind of changes you will see? Okay, next slide, please. So for example, if you measure the core level oxygen spectrum of VO2, it was found that the, the, the metallic phase has this red color asymmetric line shape, while in the insulating phase, you have this blue colored symmetric line shape. Now, this is one simple difference between a metal and an insulator. If you measure a core level, you should see this difference between a, a, a metal and an insulating phase. Next slide, please. If you did a transition metal measurement, you can see even more drastic changes because the, again, the, the multiplex, the, the, the metal site has a large number of states. And then you need to calculate and compare with experiment. And you can model you can model the calculation to, to show the metallic state and the insulating state. And, and then you can distinguish, okay, this is a metal and this is an insulator. And then the final check of the metal insulator transition is the next slide. You measure the valence band of, of this material. Now, if you see the valence band, it has a very large uh, uh, energy scale. This is uh, nearly 10 electron volts wide. And then this is the oxygen band. This is what is called the, the vanadium 4S state, okay? And then what is happening is near the zero of the energy scale, which is expanded in the inset. So you can see in one case, the red line for the metallic state cuts the zero. So this is a metal. While if you took an in, in a measurement in the low temperature to insulating phase, which is the blue line, you see it has changed, the spectral shape has changed. You can see the spectral rate has changed from near the Fermi level to about one electron volts. Now this spectral rate is always conserved in spectroscopy, okay? So this whole spectral spectrum 
is normalized for total, inten total intensity under the curve. And then you can show that there is a metal insulator transition. Okay, next slide, please. Now we'll see things about, uh, okay, this is, uh, there's always a one-to-one -one correspondence between the core level and the valence band spectra, and that confirms that you're looking at the metal insulator transition, okay? Next slide, please. So now I'll start things on superconductivity or, or superconducting materials. And this was an example of superconducting uh, uh, sample measured by tunneling conductance, which is DI by dV. And tunneling conductance, actually also one is doing a, a process which is very similar to the photoemission process. You are removing an electron and exciting it to a higher an available energy level, okay? And uh, what was found is, you, you have a, a sharp peak in the spectrum and small weak features which are marked by these red arrows. But this, this leading edge, if, if you maybe you need to go a little up to see the X scale, this, this shift, this is a zero of the energy scale, okay? And this shift, the sharp edge shows that there is a, a, a energy gap so, so this is what determines that, okay, you have a superconducting material. Now this is done by a conductance measurement, okay? So one really didn't actually measure that you removed an electron and measured it, its energy, but you applied a, a voltage and me measured a current. And so the X scale actually is voltage, but it's, it's still, you can, you can talk of it as electron volts because it's energy, okay? And this was important to do with photoemission spectroscopy. Now, this was done in 1962, okay? And this became the proof of what is called the bardeen cooper schrieffer BCS theory of superconductivity. Next slide, please. Now, the superconducting transition is actually in the, in the BCS theory is a second order temperature dependent phase transition. And that means there is an, an order parameter and then when you, when you change the temperature, this parameter is changing as a function of temperature. And this is changing continuously. And that order parameter is a superconducting gap. And this is plotted uh, as, as a, in, in reduced energy scales. So if delta naught is the, is, the, is the gap, then as a function of temperature, delta by delta naught versus T by Tc. So Tc is, if, if 10 Kelvin, then you normalize that to one. And then you see that this is the, the expected gap in the, in the BCS model. And actually this was confirmed by, by, by tunneling uh, as early as um, 1962, okay? Uh, the theory was in 1957. Now, um, what, what is, um, um, next slide please. So, so what is the, the parameter? How do you define it? And the, the quantification of the gap is like two delta naught by KBTC. If it is 3.52, the theory says this, this number, then you call it what is called a weak coupling superconductor, okay? Now, experimentally, can you get this or how does it work? And then one can measure. So this was not done by photoemission for a very long time. And then finally, we got a chance to do this in, in, in 2000, and one could measure lead and niobium. And one can also see that if you looked at this peak on a, on a more detailed scale or on a higher energy, this is, please note, this is few milli electron volts, okay? So photoemission spectroscopy with milli electron volt resolution was possible only in, in 1999. And this is actually the first experiment of the superconducting gap of lead and niobium. Okay, okay, next slide, please. Now, uh, the, the phonons that you see in the tunneling also actually are visible in, in the photoemission spectrum. So this was confirming. And then two delta naught upon KBTC from, from tunneling was estimated to be 4.5, which is larger than the BCS value. And we also measured this for, from photoemission, but it was slightly larger more. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So how does one actually do this simulation for, for the superconducting gap that you measure and 
compare it to the experiment. So one is actually to take the density of states of the superconducting BCS model, which is this first uh, graph on the top left. You multiply this by the Fermi Dirac function, which is this function here, which is multiplied to get the middle panel. Okay. And then you convolute this again with a Gaussian, which is the Gaussian resolution of your spectrometer. So you need very high resolution for this reason. Okay. And then you can get a function which you compare with a fitting function that you can compare with the experiment. So one can do this for, for the materials you measure. And okay, next slide, please. So you can see, for example, on the data, which is the circles, the, the black line is the fit. Okay. And then you can get two delta naught upon KBTC, which was 4.9 for lead. And for niobium, it was 3.7. So this is called the strong coupling superconductor. This is called the moderately strong coupling superconductor. And tunneling people prefer to plot this as, as uh, I, the current or the, the differential current as a function of voltage plus and minus voltage. But the photoemission people have to, cannot get photoemission spectra for the unoccupied states. So you, you symmetrize this thing and you can still see that. Okay, next slide, please. This is how you, you see in tunneling. And this is an example, for example, of lead. And then you can see that you have, you have um, as a function of thickness, this is recent work, okay? This is like uh, 10 years back. And, and what they found is the, the superconducting gap actually depends on the thickness of the, of the lead. And you can also see phonons if, if your sample is thick enough, okay? And uh, okay, so that's giving consistency between photoemission and, and, and uh, tunneling. Next slide, please. For, for niobium, also you can see that, okay, you can plot this scale and compare, and then you can see, yeah, okay, the gap is formed. And so you can actually see that 9.26 is Kelvin as the TC and, and the thing changes between nine and 9.6. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I need to rush. So we, we, I just show you a small case for vanadium nitride, and that's uh, a TC of, uh, of 8.5K, next slide, please. And this was known from tunneling. And then again, we confirmed it by photoemission spectroscopy. Next slide, please. Now one, the, the, I did not mention about the, the function that one uses, it's called the Dines function. And it is given by this, this part. It's the real part of this, this equation on, on the bottom right, okay? And one can actually calculate, and next slide you can see that uh, this is data and on top of them, the red lines are the fits and you can get some weak feature even just above the Fermi level, which is actually the, the same Dines function, uh, mod, the, the, the BCS model, which has got a peak even above the Fermi level, but it gets populated and at higher temperatures. It's, it's not easy to see at lower temperatures, okay? Next slide, please. And then you can get, get again a match with the BCS model behavior. So that's again, a BCS theory, but with moderately st strong coupling, again, 3.9 for, for the two delta over KVTC. Next slide, please. And one can do this for, for an oxide. And there again, you, you get a similar thing. Here you also see that, please note, we are meant, the full valence band is this energy scale, zero to six electron volts. And the superconducting gap states that we are looking in the first figure on, on the top left corner is actually very low intensity near the Fermi level zero, okay? Compared to the main valence band, which is like between two and four electron volts. And then you can actually see some structure which is marked by an arrow in this left uh, bottom figure. And that is actually related also to the phonons. In the next slide, one can actually see that that um, you can actually do what is called an Eliasberg analysis of the superconducting density of states. I don't know, something's missing here. Hmm. I don't know. Some figure is missing for some reason, I don't know. Okay, I guess we, we, we just go ahead. I don't know why it's missing. <laughs> that was showing an experiment and theory calculation for, for that, uh, oxide uh, superconductor. I next changed to angle resolved photoemission. On this experiment, 
is the same experiment as earlier of photo emission. The only additional experimental parameter is you, you change the angle of the, the emitted electrons that come from the solid, you measure it as a function of angle. So you change this angle and, and, and do this measurement. Now, um, <clears throat> what this gives you is, it gives you information of the momentum resolved uh, energies of electrons in a solid, okay? These are the equations one needs to use. And, and in, in principle, uh, it's a more sophisticated experiment, but now one has two dimensional detectors and one can do them in, an, in one shot, okay? Next, next slide, please. The information you can, you can get, particularly for quasi 1D and 2D system is, you can get what is called the, the band dispersion of the solid, uh, electrons in the solid, and you can get the points where they cross the Fermi level will, will constitute the, the Fermi surface crossing. So you can determine the Fermi surface of a solid from this experiment, okay? Next slide, please. An example, for example, from, for sodium metal, if you do this experiment of, of the valence band as function of angle or photon energy, which is an equivalent experiment, you will see that some band is changing its energy marked by these tick marks on the left panel. And then you plot that as a function of angle and the angle can be mapped onto the momentum of the electrons in the solid. And then you find that for a simple metal like sodium, it's nearly a free electron metal. And you see that the experimental dots match with the calculated free electron band dispersion, okay, which is a parabola. Okay, next slide, please. Now, basically what you're doing in, in the angle resolved photo emission measurement, which is RPS, you can measure energy at a particular momentum, or you can measure momentum as a, uh, uh, or you can measure as a function of momentum at a particular energy, okay? And, and uh, then you can, you can map out what is the band dispersion and Fermi surface of a solid. Okay, next slide, please. So this is one example of, of the same thing. You, you get a two-dimensional map. Uh, the, the Y scale is, is the energy, the X scale is the momentum. And then you can take cuts along particular directions in momentum space and then plot that as a momentum distribution curve or as an energy distribution curve, okay? It's called an EDC or an MDC. Next slide, please. So one can actually determine the Fermi surface of a, of a solid by this experiment. So now you're plotting intensity as a function, which is, which is the, the color scale, intensity variation, as a function of Kx and Ky. And then you can calculate and make a connection between experiment and theory. So the left side is experiment, the right side is theory, the colored part, okay? And this is a, a section of the Fermi surface and, and the full Fermi surface is shown here. Please go to the next slide, which shows a, a wider scale picture of the same experiment and calculation. Left side is the calculation and right side are the set of experiments, which shows that, okay, this is the Fermi surface of this material, okay? And now this material is, is a, a high temperature superconductor. Next slide, please. So one can get very sharp peaks in, if you use a laser photo emission spectrometer, and then you can, you can get a, a very accurate energy value and momentum value for, for these uh, crossings, okay? Next slide, please. Now you can, in, in recent times, you can change polarization and polarization dependent means you can, if you had two bands with different uh, symmetries, you can actually tune them. For example, zero degrees is S, S polarized or a linear horizontal and then 90 is uh, P polarized or, or vertical. And then you can pick two bands separately. And at intermediate angles, you will get both the bands because it, you get a mixture of the bands. And that's plotted here the, the, as, as momentum distribution curves or MDC. So you take cuts of this and you will get this kind of data. At, at zero, you will get one peak. At 90 degrees, you will get one peak, but separated. And at 82 degrees, you will get two peaks corresponding to the 
first two peaks. Okay, next slide. So now we are in a way it's possible to measure uh, the Fermi surface and then measure as a function of the momentum, what is the superconducting gap? In all the cases I showed before, they correspond to what is called an S wave gap, where all, 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 for all momenta, it's the same gap value, okay? So one, one can measure from an angle integrated measurement and, and, and uh, you're sure that you can get. The function also is for an S wave gap and for a D, other types of gaps, it's different. The second one is what is called a dx square minus y square wave um, symmetry. And this has four nodes. Nodes means the gap is zero at that point. So now when you change kx and ky, if you change the value of, of, or the angle of, of the measurement, you will see that the gap is maximum along the kx and ky directions. And 45 degrees with respect to either of them, the, the gap will become zero. And then one checks this by photoemission experiments. One can also have an anisotropic S wave, which means it's not the same uh, gap value at all momenta, but it has different gap values, but never it never has a node. It never becomes zero at any K point. And then there are cases where you can have multiple gaps, which is, okay, I won't show that, but I'll show the examples of other two. Next slide, please. So for example, this is a measurement of the high TC cube rate I showed earlier. So now along what is written here one, okay, this curve, you measure the, the, the gap. First, you measure at this point only, and this is the data for this one point, okay? Point number one. And then you see that you get a gap, which is clear. This is no gap here. And as you reduce temperature, you can see that this intensity changes. Okay, now if you continue, uh, you, will, you will come to a situation where um, you, can, you can measure this as a function of angle. Next slide, please. This is the, the gap value plotted along these points written one to 15 in this insect, okay? And then you see that it has this, this kind of behavior. So at 45 degrees, it goes to zero and then it goes to a maximum value. And then, okay, this is not completed there because it's, it's, it's here. If you had gone up to, if the, the people had gone up to there, then you would have seen it. So now you can actually distinguish what is a, a dx square minus y square symmetry of the gap compared to, to, to an S wave gap, okay? Next slide, please. Now I'll talk about a niobium selenide, which is a transition metal dichalcogenide. This has a charge density wave transition and which is below 35 Kelvin and superconducting below seven Kelvin. So this is a little more complex and requires higher resolution. But in, in, in the case we, we could measure, we could measure that you have clear band crossings, okay? And then this, this uh, um, small square box shows the purple, purple dots corresponds to one more Fermi surface, which is the central part num named the 16th band in the, in the bottom fit panel, okay? So 17, 18 are, are the bands on the right side here. And, and 16 is, is the small band, which is a, a small circular band at the gamma point, okay? And then you can see that the gamma point band is the small band weak feature that you see on the right bottom panel. And the high intensity features in the top right panel come from the niobium bands which is this orange colored bands in the central panel, middle panel top, okay? Next slide, please. So now you, you can get a Fermi surface, which is this green curves, and at different Fermi surfaces, for example, at the red circles are specific points on different Fermi surfaces. And then when you do the, the superconducting back gap measurement, you see that on this Fermi surface, the gap is zero. It's, there's no superconductivity below TC. But if you go to, to the hexagonal green Fermi surface in the middle panel and then measure, you can see you have a gap. And then you go to another Fermi surface, which is close to the end point here. Again, you can see a gap. And then you can, on these Fermi surfaces, you can measure. And what we found was it's anisotropic S wave on these gap, on these Fermi surfaces and on, on the small gamma circular Fermi surface, it's, it's nearly zero. Okay, 
Okay, next slide, please. I just briefly mentioned that uh, this is this is the power of, of uh, doing momentum resolved or angle resolved photo emission. Okay. Uh, I, I go to the last uh, example that I have, which is polarization dependent RPS of, of uh, a, a material, which is potassium iron arsenide, which has very low TC, okay, 3.4K. Now we needed to do this a very high accuracy measurement because it is very low temperature. And uh, we could do the experiments at two Kelvin with a resolution of one milli EV and an accuracy of plus minus 100 micro EV. So one measures the Fermi surfaces first and then the angular dependence of this gap, okay? Next slide, please. Now we're going to have some difficulty for this uh, data, okay? Because I had, uh, I had animation for, for showing this, but anyway, let's get, go on. So the spectral media resolution was actually shown to be 70 micro AV and it was tested down to one Kelvin and it uses a, a very special laser. It's called a neodymium yttrium vanadate laser, okay? And, well, and an analyzer, which is also high resolution. Next slide, please. So this is, you see the gold Fermi edge measured at 1.5K and, and the, the blue color is a fit using a, a broadening of 70 micro electron volts. This is the highest resolution spectrometer in the world actually. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, uh, one can actually show that the fitting confirms that it's 70 or one could even say, oh, no, no, it's it's about 140, but surely it's not very large, much larger than that. If you took a larger scale, you, you will, will not match the experiment, which is the circles. Next slide, please. So one tested this, this experiment with a TC of 3.7 Kelvin, which tin metal. And then you can see that you, you get this, this behavior where you see a spectral weight transfer and gap formation. And you also see this weak feature just above the Fermi level. In fact, we can also, since we know the resolution of the measurement already from the gold spectrum, we also calibrated for the temperature and it's really accurate in temperature. Next slide, please. So you see this small, the blue curve at one million electron volt above the Fermi level is plotted on an expanded scale on the right panel, okay? And then the simulation is done using a Fermi Dirac function of 0 0.9 Kelvin, 1 Kelvin and 1.1 Kelvin. And we can actually, within plus minus 0.1 Kelvin, we can say that, okay, the temperature is one Kelvin, okay? And this was important because otherwise we can't see the gap, which I'm going to show you next, okay? Next slide, please. So now this is a, this was an animation and now <laughs> the slides are, are overlapping on each other. So I need to explain uh, the two left arrows on the left side is confirming that when you have a material, which is this kind of a material where potassium is changing, this X content is the potassium content, okay? When you change the potassium content, when X is 0 0.2 or 0 0.4, you get a gap, which is an S wave gap, okay? This was shown by some work earlier. Than, than our work. Then uh, another experiment was done for, for X equal to 0 0.8 by another group. And they, from specific heat measurements and thermal conductivity, they showed that this is a nodal gap. That means this gap has nodes. While this was a full gap, which means it's an S wave gap. So what is the case actually true? And we were interested in, in a material where X is equal to one. And then we measured for, for, for that material. Okay, next slide, please. I think next slide will be totally off because it's too many spectra. <laughs> okay. This is the Fermi surface mapping, which you can match with the band structure calculation. I, I won't get into this because it's really difficult to explain now with, with uh, things overlapping one on the other. And there's something called nesting in this material. But in this particular case, when X is uh, one so that the sample is KFE2, AS2, there's no, no, no nesting. But uh, okay, this is a small detail for the Fermi surface. Uh, next slide will be a total washout because uh, you, you uh... <laughs> okay, this is different Fermi surfaces. I had animation to, to show one by one. 
but now they are all together here okay so there is a red set of crosses there is a blue set of crosses and there is a green set of crosses okay and then these are for for different fermi surfaces and and you can show that okay what are the fermi surfaces and compare it with uh, calculation and then measure the superconducting gap the next slide please i i think it's impossible to explain <laughs> because these are figures mapping one on the other now the left side red blue and green are the actual uh, photo emission measurements as a function of angle okay and the, the 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 red blue and green thick lines that you see are the superconducting gaps measured from this data i'm i'm really sorry i can't uh, show this because this was uh, like an animation but the important message is you get a gap which is very very unusual okay it's called an octet node gap there are eight nodes in this in this data which is related to this small region of the blue spectrum near zero angle okay which is expanded here in the small inset so there are two two places just plus and minus 5 degrees of zero where the there are two nodes okay and this is estimated from these gaps and these these experiments now the the result of this is you get a, a superconducting gap which has eight nodes next slide please so the nodal points if you see in the plane it is like this okay so you the black dots are the places where you get nodes and this is a very very unusual uh, uh, superconduct it's the only known case in fact okay and so we could show that you have a a, a very unusual octet node um, gap on this sample uh, superconducting gap in the sample now to i will just uh, make a short uh, thing about what could be interesting to measure because in the future please consider trying to do these experiments because these are very unusual experiments but next slide is showing you that the superconductivity of the cuprates is still an open problem we still don't know how you get a d x square minus y square gap in the copper oxide samples uh, all these other samples that i have listed here are materials which are very hot topics in in the spectroscopy of solids iron based superconductors like the one i showed you is still very difficult to understand topological materials are very important nowadays because a large number of materials have shown what are called topological properties i won't get into it but this is a surface property and photo emission is perfectly suited to measure the properties of this materials and again transition metal dichalcogenides also have been shown to have topological properties and then the the dichalcogenides also have charge density wave transition so this is still a very important system to measure Uh, recently people have found uh, high temperature superconductors under pressure in hydrides but we can't do them with photo emission okay things to remember if you want to do experiments in spectroscopy in the future is think of how you could use incident photon polarization and time resolution measurements and these are mainly possible only with laser sources but also with synchrotron okay and then one can actually use uh, photo emission still with recently there have been machines where you can do measurements on liquids and wet samples as well as you can do what is called ambient pressure like photo emission which means you can actually measure materials when they are being used as some, some in some application in in a uh, uh, ambient environment okay um okay next slide please i i i'm at nearly the end of the talk uh, i just want to say that i've tried to show you photo emission can be used to the gap to study the gap symmetry of the superconducting state and then elemental metals often are s wave superconductors high temperature super cuprates are d x square minus y square superconductors and iron based superconductors show different types of gaps including an octet node type gap okay thank you very much for your attention i'm done i'll be happy to take questions if anybody would like to ask questions i have some additional material which
which is for answering questions. I mean, it's really, I don't know what to in a wonderful, you know, like a journey, like going, uh, should I say, like, uh, felt like in, uh, George Gamow's book, you know, in 